Hey, welcome everybody to Never Stop Building. I'm Jason, and today I'm going to be making a couple shoji doors, three large shoji doors out of Port Orford cedar. And I um, thought I'd do something a little different. Uh, I don't have, all this is stop motion footage, so basically this is going to be a little bit of a class on how to make shoji doors. So the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to take all your stock and you got to inspect the grain direction and start to think about what parts are going to come out of these pieces of stock. So what I'm looking for is what is the face going to show when I mill it and what is the side going to show? Are the pieces bowed in any direction? Uh, you know, how, how are they going to look when they're milled to size? So if the grain, if this is all VG cedar, and if the grain is going in a certain direction, then both sides are going to have straight vertical grain. If it's completely what you would call in hardwoods rift sawn, then only one side is going to have really tight vertical grain and the other side is going to look flat sawn. And I want all the parts to have a consistent appearance on the front viewable face of the door, so that's why I'm spending all this time figuring out which pieces are going to go in which uh, boards. Now the other thing to keep in mind is if the, if the raw board has a natural bow to it, that's tension within the wood that will manifest itself probably again when you mill it down to size. So I want to decide, okay, if these two pieces have a slight bow to them, maybe they're going to be the vertical styles of the door and I'll put them in opposite directions so that if they bow, they tighten up on the door and that they're not going to warp the door. So there's a lot of thinking that goes into, into building a door even before you start cutting the wood because each piece of wood is different and it's going to react different. Once I've made all those decisions, then I'm just going to be cutting each piece to, to size a little bit over what the final part is going to be. Once you have all the pieces cut to length roughly, then we're going to joint two uh, sides so that we have a perfect right angle on each piece. Why am I not just uh, milling these up and then cutting them on the table saw? Well, because that's going to, that's going to release tension in the wood and we'll, we might find that a piece that we thought was going to be straight after we rip it down to size, it's actually not straight anymore and it's bowed. So we want to release that tension early and then mill the straight piece out of that wood. So you can see the pieces that are sitting on the bandsaw there, they have been um, ripped down to size and now I'm milling, uh, I'm joining them so that they're perfectly square and straight uh, regardless of any bow that might have been introduced during the rip process. And then once I've jointed those two edges, if there's a lot of extra stock, often what we're going to do is we're going to want to bandsaw off the remainder so that we're not running through the planer 100,000 times. Uh, this is just basically I set the bandsaw to the, si the rough size for those parts, and then I just take off any extra, leaving just enough so that we can plane it down. After we joint uh, two edges, now we're going to plane the piece down to finish thickness. The process here is going to be first put it through the planer so we make the rough edge parallel to the edge we jointed. And then I'm going to be flipping the piece end for end, trying to take off an equal amount from each side of the board. The reason we're going to do that is because when a board dries, it dries from the ends and the surface first and then into the center of the board. So there could be a gradient of dryness. And if we take equal amounts off of a board, we're likely to get closer to the center of that board and away from differently dried parts of the wood, which will make the board that we're finished more stable. And this can also, this will also depend on how we band sawed it and stuff like that. Uh, ultimately, beyond that consideration, I'm, there's not a whole lot to milling this down. It's just trying to hit that final thickness. I'm just going for a hair over my dimension, which I believe in this case was about an inch and a half or 44-ish millimeters, 40 millimeters. Uh, and that is so that we can hand plane it and it'll come out at final dimension. 
the critical thing with these parts is that they are uh, correct length. Uh, the thickness matters a little bit less because of the way the door is constructed. After finishing milling all the frame uh, components, now we want to make the Kumiko. So this involves ripping down one board into lots of thinner boards. Uh, and then we're going to rip those thinner boards into small little strips. And those will be our Kumiko pieces. Uh, now that we have milled down our Kumiko stock material, which is, is to the thickness of our lap joints on the Kumiko, we'll rip them all to what becomes the depth of the screen. So in this saw, I have a thin kerf ripping blade. It's a little bit bigger than a 16th or about two millimeters or so. And I just am crushing through all these blanks. Some of them are longer, some of them are shorter. The long ones are course are for the vertical Kumiko and the short ones are for the horizontal ones. I know I just spoke about not wanting to table saw most material, but because these screens are constructed in a way that self corrects for any twist or warp, it's not a huge deal that we're ripping these down after milling them to size. So you finished all the frame components and now we're working on the hip board milling. Uh, that's the board that's at the bottom of the shoji door, which in most cases keeps your cats from going through the shoji uh, paper. So I dug through uh, a lumber pile at the local lumber supplier and managed to find two pretty clear western red cedar trim boards that were much too nice for the grade of wood that was being sold there, but I snagged them anyway. Out of the two long 12-foot boards, I was able to get enough completely clear sections that I could mill them or joint them, mill them, and then resaw them then mill them again to make enough pieces that I could glue up to make these, uh, they were over four feet wide and not very long hip boards. So we have a whole bunch of completely cleaned up boards and now it's just a matter of selecting which ones will go together to make the three different panels. And uh, so much of what makes a piece of woodwork beautiful, I think is getting the grain to line up just right and, and having everything work together. So there's a lot of back and forth, figuring out which pieces should go next to each other, where any defects might be, if I can sneak a little defect to the edge where it's going to be inside the frame. And that's kind of where the work goes in. So now I need to joint a face and an opposite face so that any micro non 90 degree, um, setup of the joiner will be evened out when I glue all these panels together. So you take your board, you join it with, let's say, the front of the panel against the fence, and then you take the next board and you join it with the back of the panel against the fence. And if your joiner fence is out, those two non 90 degree angles will cancel out when you glue the stuff together. So then, you know, marking all for biscuits and I'm going to be biscuiting these panels together for alignment purposes, mostly. Once all the uh, panels have been biscuited and they're ready for glue up, I'm going to set up a large call here, line up all the panels, clamp them all together. And I'm sure at the time this was very frantic for me because there's no such thing as a calm glue up. And what I'm doing here is I'm making these calls uh, by I'm putting a bunch of tape in the center with longer and longer pieces so that the center is higher than the outside. Basically, I'm inducing an artificial crown to the calls. So when I clamp them down, they, they touch in the middle first and then they squeeze the outside. This will ensure there's clamping pressure along the entire panel. And then it looks like capped on tape that I'm putting on, and that's just to keep the glue from sticking to the calls. So it's pretty slippery stuff.
while all those panels are drying, I'm using my super precise crosscut sled with a length uh, stop to cut all the shoulders of my tenons for all the frame components. So this holds each piece at a super precise and consistent length. I made a whole video about how I built this sled. And then I have a blade with a flat top and I cut the depth of the tenon shoulder on four sides of each board. And that will make for a very crisp, tight joint. For the most part, all the male joinery, the tenons, is determined by uh, those table saw cuts for the shoulders and then my tenoning tool. Uh, the female ones are what often requires the layout. So once I've done all that initial cutting of the tenon joints, then I'm going to be laying out where all the mortises are going to have to get cut. And that, that really comes off of my plans that I've that I print out before I do any project and I'll find the center lines of each mortise. I'll mark the, the ends along the board and then I'll use a kabiki to mark the sides, which is what I'm doing right there. And that, uh, and then also the depths, then I'll, then I'll write in the depths. So that keeps me from getting confused when I'm at the mortising machine. And here I'm also putting in, uh, groove indications where I'm going to groove for the panels. So even if I'm just working alone, I'll often lay out more than maybe is necessary just because if you have a lot of parts, you forget what's supposed to happen and you really don't want to make a mistake when you've spent all this time up to this point milling these pieces. It's the same process with uh, the long styles. I use this long straight ruler to find all the locations of the joints. I've ganged up all the parts and really made sure that they're consistently clamped together so that I can lay out all of them at once. You can get yourself into big trouble doing this and it's kind of something that you have to practice because if there's any bow or there's not sufficient clamping pressure, when you draw a line across a whole bunch of boards, they might not be consistent uh, by the time you get to the other side of, of this big board. Basically, you've made a big board. So it's, it's really important that you check both sides to make sure that all the lines are completely perpendicular to that center line of the board. So I'm just kind of going back and forth, checking that, drawing in where my tenons are going to be, and then I'll also be putting in the layouts for the little uh, mortises for the kumikos to go into. What's often super helpful when you build a bunch of things is to make a story pole, which is what that little stick is that I've just clamped down. So there I've laid out once the location of all the Kumiko holes, and I'm using that story pole to transfer those marks both to the door styles and I'll have eventually transferred them to the Kumiko themselves. Uh, you know, a tape measure is the enemy because you want to only have to interpret a tape measure line once, and especially when if you're working with other people or even with yourself, when you drag a tape measure out, you might have introduced a little bit of error. And if you have to do that over and over and over again, your parts will not be consistent. But if you lay out a story pole once, any judgment calls you've made on those measurements are transferred to the story pole. And whatever that story pole says will be exactly transferred to all your other parts. So that's why I think it's important to, to do a story pole. Instead of a bottom track for these shoji, they had re little recess wheels to ride on a track. That was what I was just doing there. And now it's just mortise fest. I have my layout set. I put them all in the general mortising machine and just crush through all the mortises and do some finishing work on those wheels. And they are ready to accept the wheels. Now all the other mortises for the different pieces are going to get completed. These are the Kumiko mortises. In order to set the depth of this mortise machine, I draw a line on the end of the piece and then crank the machine down until the mortise chisel hits that line. This is a foot pedal powered mortise machine. 
when you do your mortises, you want to do the deeper ones before the shallower ones. That way, when you do the shallower ones, you're not worried if uh, it blows out into the deeper mortise. The deeper mortise does a lot more of the heavy lifting in the joint. If you were to do it in the opposite direction, uh, when you go to do that deep mortise, if you've done the shallow mortise first, then that first cut is going to blow out a little bit and not be as precise. And you want the deep mortises to be nice and tight uh, in the uh, long direction of your grain. You want them to be a slip fit uh, across grain because if they're tight cross grain, it's going to split your piece apart. If they're tight long grain, if that makes any sense, there's a lot of strength in the wood in that direction. You imagine uh, standing on, on a tree stump. You want a lot of pressure on the end grain. Now, lots of mortises to cut. You just kind of get in the zone and cut each end of the mortise and then cut the middle pieces and then go back and forth to clear out all the waste so you have nice crisp ends and nothing in the middle. The reason I cut my mortises before I cut my tenons is because I want to have the fit just right. So I do all the mortise cutting and then I can do some test pieces on my tenon cutting machine so that I have a perfect slip fit in one direction and a nice tight fit on the tenons in the other direction. I built this uh, tenon cutting machine modeled after the way they have a tenon cutter built onto a table saw in Japan. I made a whole video about about building that machine. If you don't have a tenon cutting machine, which uh, you may likely not, uh, you would be cutting these by hand or with a table saw jig or something similar that would let you cut into the end grain. This is, makes it really easy. Once I've cut all the joinery, mortises and tenons, and everything is ready, I have final step in a way to sort of indicate the piece is done, is chamfering all the tenons so that they easily feed into the mortises. Uh, when you have a large glue up, there's only three big pieces here, plus the kumiko. You really don't want a piece to not go into the hole. So a nice chamfer in the directions of feed is really important, especially on the long sides of the tenons, because often there might be a millimeter oversized, because those are really going to get compressed. You really want a nice tight joint there. And so you don't want that to crush the fibers. And once all the pieces are done, all the joinery is cut, then we're going to plane down all the pieces. So I'm using my little super surfacer here. Uh, I've since sold this machine and I have a much bigger one. But I'll send all the Kumiko through, plane those down, and then we'll send all the frame parts through, clean up all the layout lines that are on the, uh, the frame, and prep those for assembly. Uh, if lar on larger pieces, I'd be using the hand plane. I just happened to have this tool and it was nice and sharp and it made everything go a lot faster. It's only really with Kumiko on, on doors that you do work after you've hand planed the surfaces. And that's just because these parts would be very difficult to hand plane once we've cut these half flaps in them. I modified a radial arm saw to have clamps and a, and a 10 inch metric dado stack so that I could cut the single half lap joint across all the pieces at once and this worked pretty well i want to eventually make it a lot easier to line these up by adding a carriage that moves back and forth but for now this worked really well and here's another situation where you really need to get the pieces clamped consistently or as you pull that saw across the cut's going to be in a different location on the far piece than it is on the piece that's closest to the the blade and that'll mess up the way your grid um, comes together. After all those pieces were cut for the half laps, I'm cutting all the end tenons in just one go by pulling the dado stack across to cut um, what would end up being these little tenons on the end of the kumiko. One of the final steps on the frame parts is to add grooves where the floating hipboard panel will sit. So I got my grooving tool, which is basically a circular saw with a dado stack in it. And it just makes it really easy to bring the tool to the work in this case, rather than do it upside down on the table saw. 
you really need to make sure that this fits just right and isn't too deep that it cuts into the tenons. And it's nice to be able to see what you're doing by, by holding the dado stack in your hand. Here's an even better example of why the Groover tool is really handy is because these are stop dados because there's only a, a hip board on the bottom. And this would be really hard to do with a table saw data stack because you'd have to set stops and you'd have to you'd have to drop the piece down onto the table saw, which would be kind of dangerous. So uh, another great uh, endorsement for the Groover. For smaller doors, I often just order the door pulls because they make them uh, to the scale of, of what would be a, a Japanese door. For this door, because it was so large, these were basically four by eight shoji doors. I whipped up this jig that let me cut the curved groove into the center of the door poles. These blanks are very slightly uh, tapered on all four edges. So I mortise out the area for the, the door poles, chisel it square, and then when I tap in the, the, the poles, they really tightly squeeze into that mortise. And when they're planed to finish, it, there's no gaps at all. Yeah, there it is. Just putting it in there. It's super clean. So we're switching over to the tracks for this project. Uh, traditionally, you'd have grooved tracks on the top and the bottom, the bottom being the shiki and the top being the kamoi. In this application, we're making the kamoi traditionally, and the shiki is going to be a maple board with little grooves cut into it that those wheels will sit into. And that'll be a little more uh, unobtrusive in this home. I don't have a joiner that is big enough to handle a board of this size, so instead I have to treat it as I might a uh, timber for a timber frame where I'm squaring up one edge. I put my jointing fence on the large planer, then squaring up the other face, checking for any twist, checking for squareness, trying to do all the joining operations by hand, and then I can use the planer to square everything up. So even I have to use the hand plane just to make sure everything fits just right. This is beautiful wood, so I really didn't want to just plane away its thickness to the size I needed, so I started by resawing off a thin little strip to get the board down to a little bit above what I'm going to mill it to. And now milling this long 12 foot board to thickness. This, <laughs> this board is so big, I had to open up the door on one side of the shop. I mean, it's basically rearranged the entire shop just to mill this board. That's definitely come a long way since this video was recorded. So for the three big grooves in this Kamoi, I have a different grooving tool that I'm using to do the, the heavy hogging that has specific sized bits for the different width grooves and, uh, and quite a bit of power. And once I've hogged out the bulk of the material, I'm going to switch back to my other groover, which has a wobble blade. Basically, you turn these two wheels and it makes the blade tilt on its rotational axis. And the more it tilts, the wider its cut is. But it's very sharp and it leaves a really clean cut, so I didn't want to, I don't want to ruin it by hogging out a ton of material, whereas this can really do a lot of the heavy lifting. And then I just do the finish cut, which is a lot cleaner with my normal grooving tool. I don't know if you can see if it's any different, but kind of take off just a little bit more and bring it to the final groove size. So I flip the header over and I'm going to do two more grooves that are the thickness of drywall so that when they install this in the rough opening, they can slide the drywall down into these grooves and it'll be a super clean finish. For the shiki, again, it's a maple board with these thinner grooves. Up close there, more uh, little troughs with chamfered edges, and that lets those wheels sit down into them. This, is, this again, it's not going to show up as much again on their finished floor as a deeper um, traditional shiki. Once everything is done 
from a milling and joinery perspective, all the finishing has to happen, all the little details. So we chamfer all the cor all the edges, plane down all the faces to make it nice and smooth, and prepare for final assembly. You may be able to see some holes in this Kamoi, and that is so that they can screw it into the rough frame and um, supplying plugs that will go up in those holes once the screws are in there and plant, you'll be able to chisel those away or sand them away and you'll never be able to see that when the doors are in. So to save the blade on my chamfer plane, I use a chamfer bit on the router to take away most of the stock and then finish it with the chamfer plane and give that a nice smooth hand planed edge. Then just sending every piece through the super surfacer to plane it down and give it that finished look. It's kind of cool. You see in the shavings, the square holes for the Kumiko mortises. It just planes it right off. No problem. Planing a super wide panel, especially one out of Western Red Cedar, is difficult. Uh, this was kind of one time when I just took the plunge and I was really happy with the results. It really, you can see the shine just appear as we go across the board. Getting your blade just deadly sharp, having a, a very little bit protruding. And I don't know if I even use a chip breaker here because cedar is a strange wood where it planes better without a chip breaker. And I made sure that there was these little bits of relief on the corners of the blade so that I wouldn't make as many tracks and I went for it, and I think it turned out pretty nice. Glue up and assembly time. Uh, putting together the Kumiko lattice, it's kind of a stressful process because you weave them. They're not, you don't sit all the horizontals down on the verticals. You kind of do half and half. So the top set of horizontals go down onto the verticals. And then you install the other vertical down onto those horizontals. And then you turn it over and you have to pivot these last ones and they do the opposite thing. And this, because you want these joints to be tight, if you were to put all the pieces in from one side, the tightness of the joinery would, would make a bow in the whole lattice work. Whereas if you, alternate and balance it out that that kind of cancels each other out it, it doesn't want to make this banana shape of the vertical kumiko or the horizontal kumiko it kind of evens out that pressure the alternative would be you'd have to cut your half laps much too loose and, and you'd see the the joinery and once we have our lattices together and now it's the real show the real stress of the glue up we got these thin little pieces and they all got to go into these little holes and they all got to go in correctly and at once. And especially on the Kumiko, there's no tenon shoulders on two sides. So if you don't get them in the right place and you're not paying attention when you clamp them down, it's going to force that tenon into the side above or below the mortise and crush the fibers. And it'll be super visible because there's no tenon shoulder to hide it. Whereas the other tenons, if there's a little bit of misalignment and it mars the entrance to the tenon, that'll get hidden by the shoulders. So it's really important what I'm doing right here where I'm checking each location of the, of the tenon that goes into the mortise. And I'll kind of I'll, I'll go down the line, making sure they all line up, tapping everything in and putting in all, all stuff on one side and then we put the final style in, put in the uh, hip board there. And now we're getting ready to put that final style on. This is the hardest one. So now everything's in place. I have to put this in from the top side. So I, I'm worried about glue dripping out and I have to get everything lined up. And I can't really hammer on it too much because I don't want to mar the surface, which is why I have that block there. 
So it can be a combination of hammering or clamping with protection and double checking as we clamp along the way that tenon is going into its respective mortise. Again, super stressful, glue up, but we got it done. And you'll notice that the styles are longer than the door, and that is because you don't want the tenons to blow out those mortises. So you leave them extra long, and then once all the glue is dried and everything is squared up, you cut them at the end and do your final finishing work at that point. When assembling these doors, obviously it's really important that they be square because you don't want the, them to look terrible. So I'm checking the diagonals after I've clamped everything together, and I'm doing a little bit of persuasion to uh, change those diagonals. So I'm either hitting one corner or another, and that moves that into square. On larger stuff, you might even put a ratchet strap or some sort of rope so that you can pull it into square and make sure everything's at a right angle. Now the door is completely dry. I clamp on my makeshift track saw and we cut off the horns, as they're called, nice and square and do that on both ends. And once we have those completely cut, I'll trim, trim the horns so that there's a matching uh, rebate at the top and that's what's going to go in the tracks. The last step of any Shoji door project of course is attaching the washi paper so I start by putting down this special Japanese double stick tape which is kind of the modern stand-in for the rice glue. Uh, I find it pretty much easier to work with on, on these styles of doors. You stretch it out onto all the Kumiko backs, trim it to length, and then when you have all your tape where it belongs, you lay the paper down, fix it in the middle, and then pull your tape as you push the paper to the outside corners, and that will make for a, a really nice flat washi paper surface. These doors were actually so big that I couldn't even use a full sheet of paper. I had to use, I had to get way more paper than necessary, trim it down, and then have a seam in the middle. So instead of starting in the middle, I'm seaming it over one of the Kumiko. And it's the same process. Once it's seamed, it becomes effectively one piece of paper in the middle. And then we'll pull all the tape and uh, attach the paper. I've roughly cut the paper down a little bit larger than the, the final size, and then I've sharpened up my kabiki, which is a marking gauge with a, a blade in it. Super sharp, and I use that to trim off the paper just to the right reveal. And in this case, I had to use a, a, this as a cutting guide to trim the paper. And so now we have the paper nice and squared up, and the shoji door is complete. Since this door was going to get shipped to the client, I, I made this really fancy box with rigid foam insulation and packaged all these doors up super solid so that they wouldn't get destroyed in shipment. Uh, the client drove out to the place, 
strap these cartons down to his trailer and away he went and they turned out uh, pretty solid here's a picture of them finally installed and uh, they're really big but uh, I think they turned out pretty good uh, thanks for watching to the end of this extremely long video uh, I hope you found this information helpful please put any comments or questions put any questions in the comments section and I'll uh, be sure to answer them. So thanks a lot for watching, and we'll see you next time.